Well, I know I see a, f- a few new faces out there today, and so if you don't know anything about our church, um, welcome. We um, planted six years ago this month, and something that I love about this church and being in this church for a number of years is, I, I, and I tell our community group this all the time, I tell our members this all the time, like I love that I can just come and just be honest. And if I'm having a hard week or a hard day or a, just a hard whatever, parenting season, or maybe that's just all of parenting. I don't know. Um, All right, I'm getting from the older parents. Yep, it is. Uh, Great. Awesome. Can't wait. Um, But yeah, I I love that I can just come and just be like, hey, life is hard, right? I don't don't have to put on a pretty face or smile. I can come broken. I can come not knowing what the rest of the day holds. Um, And and I, I, I love that. But as, as much as I feel the freedom and the ability to do so, sometimes it, it still gets exhausting, right? The life's hard. Um, I mean, even, even this morning, I was talking with a couple who, yeah, the, like another anniversary of, of grieving the death of a loved one. And you're like, God, why do I feel so alone? Right? Or, or whatever suffering we're walking through. I mean, we're like, okay, what, what is God doing in all of this? What's he planning? What's he intending? Like, why can't I experience the joy right now anymore? Or we just feel sin and we're just like, I'm, I am so unworthy to be loved by God. Why in the world does he keep loving me? And so we feel that God's distant, right? Or even when we hear sermons, like these sermons that we've been in this part of Revelation, we hear sermons on heaven, you're like, that's going to be great one day. It's light at the end of the tunnel, but it seems so far off. I mean, we, we wouldn't say that God's distant, but yet we have these thoughts and these feelings and these instances in our life that put these doubts in our mind, just feeling like we're just so separated and so distant from God. And I think this passage today shows us that there is hope, not just of the future, but even hope today for us when we find ourselves in that place and we're like, where is God? Why does he seem so far off? Where has he been? What's he doing? And what's interesting about this passage is, you know, we've, we're, I said last week, we kind of have three different pictures of heaven here at the end of Revelation before we get to kind of the epilogue of the letter. And so what, what's fascinating, though, about this passage is that it's a lot about architecture, right? If you guys have ever read Revelation before, or you've even looked at Revelation 21, you probably know those verses in verse 1 to 8. Those are the ones we read at funerals. Those are the ones we we read when our body hurts. Those are the ones that we read when we're aching. But not a lot of us are like, hey, let's go talk about the 12,000 stadia big city, right? But there's actually, when we look at this passage and we see where and how this city is built and what is inside the city, I think we actually find a lot of hope. So let's look this morning at the first couple verses or so. The first, we'll kind of break it up a a paragraph-ish at a time. So the first paragraph kind of deals with like the location or the foundation of this holy city. So in verse 9, it says, one of the seven angels who came with the seven bowls of, of the seven last plagues came to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, right? That's the church, the people of God, the, the wife of the lamb. And so then John's carried away in the spirit, He's carried away in the spirit in verse 10 to a great high mountain. And what's fascinating about the great high mountain is that, you know, when, I remember one pastor told me, he said, all the prophets kind of rendezvous in Revelation. So we're pulling in a lot of biblical things coming together here. And so if you think about the mountain, though, throughout the Bible, that's where God's chosen to disclose himself and reveal himself to his people. I mean, Mount Sinai, Right? It was the great mountain where, I mean, Moses was so exhausted, I think he didn't eat for a week after that happened because he, he, he like, got the law from God, the revelation of God through the Ten Commandments. I mean, we've seen this. We've seen this with the burning bush. We've seen this with where the temple sat on a mountain in the middle of the city. And even when Jesus, in his earthly ministry, when he was transfigured in glory with Peter, James, and John right in front of him that was on a mountain. So all the time throughout Scripture, we're we're talking, we're seeing this, this mountain is this place where God reveals himself. 
And yet here it's coming down out of heaven from God. It's coming from him. And so even when we just read these first two verses, what's, what's fascinating about taking these together is that the new Jerusalem is both a city and a bride. It's both a place and a people. Both. Remember, some of this is symbolic. That doesn't mean that there won't actually be a real city, but we also need to understand what the symbols are trying to communicate. And what's being said here is that all that is said about Zion or Jerusalem in the Old Testament, all that's been prophesied, all that it's heading towards, it's being fulfilled here in the new Jerusalem where God dwells with his people. And one more thing before we move on to verse 11 is I want us to contrast this with Babylon and how Babylon was described. Because in chapter 17, verse 3, he says that an angel comes to John. I'll just make sure I don't misquote this. And um, in chapter 17, verse 3, it says, He carried me away in the spirit. So same phrase, but not to a mountain, to a wilderness. And I saw a woman, he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. It had ten horns, seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and impurities of sexual immorality, and on her forehead was a name, was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And John's carried away in these two instances, it's these two pictures that could not be any different. Could not be any different. One, he goes to a wilderness. The other one, he goes to a mountain. One, he sees a prostitute drunk with all of the finest things of this world that she could adorn herself with, but it's disgusting. And in this one, he sees a pure, beautiful, holy, stunning bride with her white garments, which represents the deeds of the saints we saw in chapter 19. I mean, this is a pure, faithful bride. That's what the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, will be like, the people and the place of God. I mean, it's breathtaking. We see that in, in verse 11. Look at verse 11. It says, having the glory of God, its radiance was like the most rare jewel like a jasper, clear as crystal. I mean, John's just searching for words here. It's indescribable to him. It's, it's radiant. It's, it has the most exquisite color and, and brightness. And there's, I mean, jaspers are, are rare and crystals were clear. And so he's just thinking of pictures to try to describe what he's seeing here. And then in verse 12, he sees a wall, a great high wall which, you know, the walls around the city back then protected the city from invasion and from enemies and from threats. And we see here that the 12, a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels, the 12 angels were protecting it. We'll get more to the wall in a minute, but I want to keep going, okay? Then um, we have 12 gates in verse 13. And, and what's fascinating is in verse 12 and 13, it says that the 12... The names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on these gates, which means the 12 tribes, that's, that's Israel, God's people in the Old Testament. So it's trying to convey like, hey, the wall here, what, what's surrounding and encompassing and kind of making this city strong is the Old Testament believers, the people that believed in God and followed him in the Old Testament. And on a deeper level, John's also showing like this is the promise of the restoration of Israel that we've been longing for since they went into exile. I mean, this is what they've been longing for and hoping for, and it's now fulfilled in the New Jerusalem. But then when you keep reading on in verse 14, it says the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Okay, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The apostles, which represented the New Testament people of God. So you have the gates representing the Old Testament people of God, the foundations representing the New Testament people of God. I mean, we know that Christ says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We church and Christ is our cornerstone. So that's being pictured here, right? The apostles and, and the prophets in the New Testament are the foundation, the foundation of this new city 
Obviously, through the revelation of Christ, as he is the cornerstone. And all these people in this city, it's, it's grounded on the apostolic testimony, the revelation of God, as we see in the scriptures. So when you put this together, right, the, the gates and the foundation, the Old Testament, New Testament, when you, when you put this together, what we see here, I don't know what tradition you were raised in, but there are not two peoples of God. It is not Israel and the church. There is one unified people of God in one city dwelling in unity in the presence of the Lamb. Harmoniously, gloriously, peacefully. I was talking with a brother about this on Friday at coffee. I'm like, the, the fact that we will exist in peace and in unity forever gives me so much hope in the broken relationships that I have right now. The fact that there is zero relational strife in heaven, zero, that actually truly gives me some hope. And it also kind of helps me just like let things here go because I'm like, what does this matter? Why? Why am I holding a grudge? These, these arguments and these disagreements, that's an old world thing. That's not what it's going to be like in the new world. I mean, the new covenant here is, is realized in its fullness. I love the way that, that one pastor said this. He said, as the Old Testament points forward to and anticipates and is fulfilled in the New Testament, which is this picture we see here, the people of God are centered around and centered on the revelation of Jesus Christ through the apostolic testimony. So, I mean, that, that's the picture, right, that we see in this paragraph, is that God's city is built on and surrounded by, like really made up of, God's people. That obviously, it's, it's not because we're amazing, but it's because Jesus washed us clean and, and made us beautiful. And that's what we're going to see in the second paragraph. So let me show you. When we look at these walls, now this is probably one of the, the you know, we kind of just skip over this part when we read it. But I want us to look at what verse 15 to 21 is actually trying to communicate. Look at this. In, in verse 15, there's a big, big, big city. It says, the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. So 12,000 stadia, for you math whizzes, um, is about 13,060 miles, or to put it in American terms, um, about from Chattanooga, Tennessee. You guys know? Yeah? All right. If you're not good at geography, just, it's big, all right? So from Chattanooga, Tennessee, all the way out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, up to the Canadian border. It's massive, right? But he's not just saying, hey, here's the actual exact specifications of what this is going to be. Right? Twelve represents the people of God, and a thousand is, is completion or perfection. I mean, we've seen this all throughout Revelation. So he's saying, like, it is big enough, it's massive enough that it's going to contain the whole people of God, everyone who believes in Christ. But what's staggering about this is the sentence at the end of verse 16. Its length and width and height are equal. Okay, nobody gasped. Um, it's a cube, in case you put that together. It's a cube. Now, why this is so amazing? There is only one other cube in the Bible. And that's what this is saying. Yeah, that's the fulfillment of, right? There's one other cube in the Bible. So as, as Josh was reading that story earlier, we, we know the story about Adam and Eve in the garden walking with God. And it's the beautiful picture of like, hey, God's here. Let's go on a walk again. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's glory. I mean, it's, it's so perfect and right. And then we know what happened, right? If, if you didn't grow up like me in the church, raised on these stories, hopefully you were paying attention when Josh was reading that. They sinned. They said, yeah, we, we don't want to keep loving you and keep doing what you love. And we don't want to keep walking with you. We want to go do our own thing. Last week, we, we read of the curses that came forth from that. But after that, if you read on at the end of Genesis 3, it says that they were put outside the garden. And the garden was guarded by those warrior angels, the cherubim, so they could never come back in. So that's kind of the human problem, right? Is that we were designed to be in the presence of God, yet our sin put us outside of the presence of God, and now we are unable to get back in because we're not holy. 
And when I say holy, I've, I've used this before, this is the easiest way for me to try to describe why we just can't keep doing good things to get back into God's good graces, all right? So if, if we're sinners, that means we've, we've broken at least one law, at least one law, right? Nobody's perfect, anyone perfect at all? I know Jesus is, but I'm asking if anyone here is. No, no one is. So even if the, the, be- the worst day of your life, you got a 99, which is better than probably any of us, right? You get a 99 on a test. No matter how many hundreds you get after that, which, by the way, being live, like living around enough people, we're not going to, none of us are getting a hundreds. But just to tease out the analogy, let's say we start with the 99. No matter how many hundreds we get, we'll never get back to 100. We will always be imperfect. We will never be able to get that perfect record again unless somebody says, hey, I have a perfect record. I'm going to take your imperfect record and I will give you my perfect record, right? So that's the problem that we're in. That's the problem that we're stuck in. And so because we can't get back to God, we can't enter his presence because we are unholy and unrighteous and imperfect, the story of the Bible is God coming to his people. I mean, that's one of his names, Emmanuel, God with us. He came to his people. He, he came, I mean, as we read in Genesis, he, he came to his people. He came to his people one night at the river and wrestled with Jacob. He came to his people as they're leaving Egypt. and He's guiding them as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. He came to his people on Mount Sinai. He came to his people over and over and over. And even as they're, they're camping in the wilderness, moving around, wandering around the desert for 40 years. God says, yeah, I, I'm going to dwell in the midst of you guys. When, like when you set up tent and we camp out here tonight, my tabernacle will be in the center. I mean, it was so important because in the tabernacle, there was this place called the Holy of Holies, which was a perfect cube. It was the place that the keep out curtain hung around, as we just read. And all of Israel was supposed to order their lives around this cube inside the tabernacle. They were supposed to live around it, walk around it. They wouldn't go with it. I mean, Moses said earlier, he's like, unless you go, we're not going to leave. Unless you go with us, God, we're not going to leave. We, we, we want to order our lives around. I mean, they'd even visit it, but they could never get in. And what's fascinating is if you read, I don't know if you've read through the Bible before, but maybe you've gotten to Numbers before you're like, all right, I don't get it. Um, But if if you read Numbers 1 and 2, it looks like a bunch of lists, but basically what is told is that the 12 tribes of Israel, 11 of them are supposed to live around this tabernacle, around this cube. And there was one tribe, the Levites, who were the priests, and, and they lived between the other 11 tribes and the tabernacle but they weren't protecting the cube from the people. They were protecting the people from the cube. Because if you think about like the the holy, awesome, powerful presence of God, like the God that spoke the earth into existence, the God that parted the Red Sea and then drowned Pharaoh's army in it afterwards, the most powerful thing we could think of times infinity dwelt in that box. And he is so holy and so righteous. We read it earlier. Like no one can even look at his face and live. So God gave this system or this plan for his people that said, okay, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to do something to make this right so that I can dwell in your presence and not absolutely just consume you. So he had this thing called the Day of Atonement where the high priest would go one day a year, would go into the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. I mean, if he went in any other day, he would die. And if he didn't go in that day, they would die. And if anyone else went in, I mean, this is the stakes, right? They would tie a rope around his leg, I think, so that in case he dropped dead in the presence of God, no one had to go in and die to pull him out, but they could just pull him out with the rope. Like, that's the stakes of what's happening here. And every single year, the Day of Atonement came around. Over and over and over. And the people are like, man, I, I just, I wish, like Moses, I just, I wish 
could just see your face. I wish I could be with you. I wish that this could be made right. And after centuries of doing this, over and over and over again, this blessing that God's dwelling with them, but also this threat of like, we could also die. God said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do something that will fulfill and finish and do away with this once and for all. Because we couldn't go up to God, Jesus came down to us. And he walked and talked and, and lived and ate and slept. But he was perfect in every single way. Like the actual perfection that God requires, the 100%. Jesus is the only guy who ever batted a thousand, right? But then he said, no, I'm, I'm going to take your record of sin and I'll give you my record of righteousness. And that's what happened at the cross when he died in our place. He's saying what, what you deserve for your imperfection, for your unrighteousness, I will take on myself. And when he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, I mean, this is, this is what happened. This is what happened that not just anyone could enter the presence of God. And so God said, you know what? The, my, the fullness of myself will dwell in this person that will come to you. And he paid for our sins as our great high priest, as our sacrificial lamb. The sacrificial lamb that fulfilled the sacrificial system once and for all. I mean, if you think about the way that he died, he was brought outside the city walls of Jerusalem so that we could be brought in. He was nailed to a tree because it was our sin at a tree in Genesis that kicked it out. And, and he, he went on the tree and became the curse for us that we could eat of the tree of life in the New Jerusalem. I mean, his, his blood washed us clean. It, it cleansed us. It cleansed us. I mean, and when he died, as we read, the, the curtain around that cube the keep out sign, it, it tore, and it tore not from bottom to top because some teenagers were in there messing around, but from top to bottom saying, God has ripped this saying, there is now no more separation between me dwelling with my people. I mean, that's what Christ's death accomplished for us. I mean, this is, this is what's so amazing. If you think from Genesis all the way through the cross is that we now can have the presence of God as believers on this side of the cross. I mean, it's incredible. It's amazing. Like, we're actually invited into this. If you've never heard this before, or maybe you've been in church and you've heard about this or, or are familiar with this, I want you to know, like, what you have to do to come to Christ is just come. Not, not be perfect. He said, hey, I, I'll take care of that. I will take care of all of that. Just come to me. I, I love forgiving sinners. I love fixing messes. I love just taking broken things and making them beautiful. I mean, that's, that's what he does in saving us. That's why I said, you know, I can come to church and be a mess. And it actually makes God's grace and his love and his glory in the midst of his people all the more glorious. Because now I'm not faking it. I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I bring nothing to the table. So if anything good here happens, it's all God. It's nothing any of us do, but yet him through us for his glory. So if, you, if you've never heard that before, just come to him. Repent of your sins. Turn, turn from that. Say, I don't want to keep trying to do this on my own. It's not going to work. Come to him. All right, so tie in all of that context. I know that was like a Bible class. But tie all of that context into this city, this perfectly cube-shaped city. What John is saying here, in that last line that you guys need to gasp at when I read, it's length and width and height are equal. <gasps> what he's saying is that God's manifold presence is no longer confined to a cube that nobody but one person once a year can enter. God's manifold presence and, and manifold glory is now the entire city, the whole new Jerusalem, the whole new Jerusalem. I mean, God's presence fills the city where we get to dwell forever. Like, this is our home, guys. This is our home, church. And this is why the city's so beautiful. Look at verse 18. I'm not going to try to pronounce all of those jewels. But if you see, it, like, the, the walls were built of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. 
and the foundations of the walls of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. I mean, it's beautiful. I remember a, a professor at Baylor in one of my classes, he, he made us walk around campus one day because it was nice outside. It was like one of those two weeks in the spring where it's not super cold windy and also not like miserably hot. Um, so he said, hey, let's go outside today and walk. And it was a gospels class and it was about Jesus teaching on heaven. And as we walked around campus, we finally got back to Tidwell and he said, hey, before we, guys, before we go, I wanna ask you guys, how many different surfaces do we walk on today? I said, ooh, all right, for sure, grass. Baylor loves grass. Um, there's some pavement, definitely. Maybe some gravel. I don't know the other three. Oh, brick, brick. Okay, for sure, got brick. Baylor loves brick. Um, but I didn't know the last two. And you know, he rattled them off, whatever they were. And then he said, this is what's fascinating about how beautiful heaven's going to be. The most amazing, precious, material that we humans kill people over here on earth. We put into wedding rings. Like that, we're just gonna walk on it like it's nothing. That's how glorious heaven's going to be. We'll just walk, it, it's beneath us. I mean, that's how beautiful heaven will be adorned because the presence of God is there. But, but this is what's wild is we don't just get to witness this. We don't just get to see this and live in this. But if you look at these 12 gems, just some of them I can't pronounce. If, if you look at where these are elsewhere in the Bible, these were the 12 gems that were on the breastplate of the high priest when he went into that cube on that day. It, it represented the people of God being near his heart and coming, and he was coming on behalf of all of the people of God as a representative into the presence of God to make atonement for their sins. And so what, what John's saying here is not only are it, do those walls and those jewels represent the people of God, that, that we will be made beautiful, like these pearls that it says each of these walls were like pearls, a single pearl, which is just massive. You can't even calculate how much that's worth. It's going to be amazing. But what he's also saying, not just that you will be perfect, but that God is making you perfect so that you believers will adorn the glory of God in his city forever. And God will make us so beautiful that we will add beauty to the infinite beauty of God in his city forever. I mean, this is absolutely astonishing when you understand what the architecture here is communicating. And as beautiful as that is, we've, we're only standing outside the city. We haven't even gone in yet. And the true treasure lies inside the walls. So let's look at the last paragraph. What is, what is inside? What is inside this new Jerusalem? Let me get a little water first. So if you know Jerusalem in the Bible, that's where the temple dwelt. And that was kind of the centerpiece of the entire city, Jerusalem. I mean, people who didn't live in Jerusalem, they would come all the way just to visit that place. Because why? The cube, the cube of the presence of God in the center of the temple. And what's so fascinating is that he's like, all right, let's go inside the city. Verse 22, I saw no temple in the city. You're like, what? Why is there no temple in the city? Well, he tells us. He says, for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. I mean, remember that the, 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 the cube was inside the temple in the Old Testament, but now the cube is the city, right? God's presence was just inside a cube in the temple, in the tabernacle, in the old world. And now, in the new Jerusalem, God's presence is the entire city. And it says that, that he and the lamb are the temple. They are the presence of God. They are where atonement has been made. They are where we find cleansing. They're where we find communion with God. That's where we fellowship with God. That's where we get to be in his presence forever. And the result of that we see in verse 23 and 24 is that there's glory and light and every single person from all these nations, the, the multitude we've been reading about all throughout Revelation, all tribes, languages, peoples, tongues, nations, they're all coming together and everyone's illuminated by this glory and strengthened by this glory and it's the light. 
It's the light that lights up the whole city. We don't need these lights in the new world. Lights, they're an old world thing. We don't need these anymore because we'll be in the glorious presence of God. And, and another fascinating feature we, we see in verse 25 and on is that the, the gates are open. They're open. So you're like, wait a minute, but I thought the walls were massive to protect us. Why are the gates open? Well, because it's safe. No, no curse is there. Even, remember what's already happened in chapter 20. Evil's been done away with. Satan's been done away with. All hell and death, anything that could threaten us has been done away with and thrown in the lake of fire forever. And so the walls are like, man, this is a safe place, but the gates are open. It's because, oh yeah, there's actually nothing that will really threaten us here. We're safe forever. Nothing unclean, no one detestable. But it's, it's also open, right? And the nations are, are coming in. I had a, a friend try to, like, you're like, okay, what in the world does that mean? Like, why do we need walls if the gates are, I mean, what John's trying to say here is that locks are a thing of the old world. There's no need for locks in heaven. There's no need for locks in the new Jerusalem. I mean, we have this, this peace and we have no night, no night at all. Why do we have no night? Because of what Christ did for it. Like he is the radiance of glory. And, and what's even more fascinating about this is if you link this to what he has done for us at the cross, like in the middle of the day, he experienced darkness and separation from God so that for all of eternity, we would never experience night. We would never experience any separation from God, but we'd be in his presence, in his glory forever and ever. And that, that's what I love about this is that, there, yes, there's, there's peace amongst believers here. And yes, there's great dwelling in unity. And there are other passages that talk about that. But what's, what's so amazing about this is that John just meant, he kind of mentions or hints at us being with each other. But that's not where his focus is. His focus here is on how beautiful this city is, how glorious the presence of God is, and that he is our greatest joy and greatest satisfaction, and that for all eternity we'll have fellowship with that. That's what John wants us to see. That's what John wants us to know. And I cannot wait for this. I mean, this is the answer. This is our hope when life gets hard, when we feel lonely. When, when we're questioning late at night, God, how many more people are going to turn on me? Why don't I feel close to anyone? I don't, where are you? What are you doing? This is our hope. This is our answer, that we will dwell in the perfect, peaceful, pure presence of God forever. And we'll never leave. We'll be safe, but yet invited. And we will never ever leave. Like this is where, this glorious city here is where we will dwell, dwell forever. It's our eternal home. And let me just end with this. What's even more amazing about all of that is that we don't have to wait. Yes, that's the fullness of it in its perfected form, but we get some of that now. We get some of that now. I mean, as we see this picture here of the city on the hill forever, what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, you church, you believers, you who are united with me by faith and indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you are a city on a hill. You are the temple of God. Like we, when we gather and when we sing and when like we get to experience a foretaste of what this will be like. That's why I'm like, man, Sunday it genuinely is the best day. I love it. I love that we get to come together and sing and, and gather together because like, we can experience his presence now and, and even each of us as believers. I mean, I, I love that in Romans 8, Paul says that he's talking about the Holy Spirit, but he says the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. So in a sense, I mean, we can ask God, why, why do you feel distant? And he's like, I am within you. I am abiding in you and you in me. You might not feel it. You might not know it sometimes, but I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm always, always there with you. And this is what, I mean, this is just the absolute, I mean, I, I, I love 
I, I joked with Josh and Robert. I was like, I, you know, part of me just wants to just read the whole book of Hebrews um, on Sunday because I think it really shows the sacrificial system, and how that gets fulfilled in Christ and on. But, but let me read to you this one passage of what this means for us. What, because at the very end, it says those who will enter will be in the Lamb's book of life. It doesn't say the Lion's book of life. It doesn't say God's book of life. It says the Lamb. Those who have been ransomed by the blood of the Lamb. Those who have been washed clean by his blood and united themselves to him through that sacrifice. Because of what he did as our great high priest and great sacrificial lamb. It says, since we have that great high priest who passed through the heavens, he ascended to heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. And I know this gets read a lot when we're going through hard times, but I want you to think about the, all of the context of what we've just worked through this morning. And hear this, when, when you feel broken or you feel lonely or you feel isolated or you feel hopeless, because of what God has been doing throughout all history and what Christ has did ultimately in the cross and where he's bringing us home to, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect because he came here as a person, fully God, fully man, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. To do what? Grant us future access? Sure. But look at what the writer of Hebrews says next. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Guys, we can come to God whenever. We don't have to wait for a certain day a year. We don't have to be the, the one high priest. We don't have to be born into a certain tribe. We, we can come to God because of what Christ has done for us whenever. Because we have the Spirit in us, we can come to Him and, and pray. We can lament. We can cry out to God. We can just talk with Him. And, and walk with him and just not, we don't even, sometimes we don't need things from God to just be able to spend time with him. He's a loving heavenly father who loves to dwell with us and Christ has granted that to us. And, and every single time that we come to God, not only do we experience him and get a foretaste of eternity, but we are drawing nearer, as we draw near to the throne of grace, it's like we're drawing nearer to the new Jerusalem every single time or we'll be with him forever and all eternity. That is our hope. 